button. I would like to share you some examples about really bringing open science and then online learning together. Like I call it jointed online learning, open science, but you can call it linked or combined or anything else. So um, my name is uh, Tomi Kaupin. I'm uh, currently um, a docent and project leader in uh, Aalto University School of Science especially focusing on online learning. So I'm a docent in media technology, so that is, the, that is one of the backgrounds. But then at the same time, I'm also uh, affiliated with the um, University of Münster in Germany, in the Institute for uh, Geoinformatics. So this is, um, this is also um, where I actually need to use online learning tools, because I cannot be there, for example, right now, when they are teaching exactly right now, uh, their students. Um, so you can um, you can contact me also uh, via email and and uh, website. There is more information. Let's look at one example. So this is uh, based on all on open data. So this is uh, a campus area in Germany. Uh, we can zoom in and and zoom out and and browse the information about publication per build uh, publications per building. So a rector can see like, okay, which uh, faculties have produced more and, uh, you know, like how, how the university really operates. And you can think about, I mean, this is of course publications, but you can think of anything else. Like, uh, for example, it could be projects or a number of people. It could be, you know, anything that you can imagine. Um, and this is of course possible only when you have a lot of different kinds of data sets like you need links between like people you need links between um, um, uh, of course buildings you need I mean you need to really combine all of these together and share all of these together right so um, the um, the um, great um, possibility of course uh, of the of the openness is that it actually brings trust so think about the previous example so if you publish all data about publications that who has done and what they have done where i mean it already brings some trust that okay well i mean we don't hide anything we just publish everything that we have done you were talking about mika was talking about uh, uh, publishing about uh, research data as well. I mean, all of these bring trust. And of course, what trust brings collaboration. We can actually do something together if we trust to each other. If we collaborate, I mean, easily, you know, you just need to share. It's, it's kind of a loop, right? Um, and of course, sharing brings a lot of learning. You learn what others have done. And of course, it brings a lot of fun, to put it, put it similar ways. So you can uh, combine different kinds of data together. You can start seeing, you can start understanding what actually uh, happens in the, um, in the world. So for example, let's take, um, this is an example of, um, of different kinds of university data coming from many different universities. So this is example from three different universities. This is one uh, initiative I was um, uh, part of uh, like five, I think four or five years ago, we established this link at universities.org. So the idea is that all these universities, um, there are Bristol, um, Open University in, in UK, Münster in Germany, Aalto University as well, um, publishing um, their data about, let's say, publications, about people, projects, buildings. So if you think about all of this, so we can actually try to understand not just how single university operates, but also compare how different universities operate. I mean, how they perform, how, what are they actually doing? Uh, learn about uh, interesting topics that they are doing, and of course, perhaps then find uh, some collaboration partners. Um, so this is all about learning. And if you think about it, really think about it. I mean, we cannot learn how universities perform and work if we don't have the data openly available. It's very hard. I mean, we all know that universities uh, publish, of course, reports about their work. But I mean, who really finds all of these reports? I mean, how do you really compare two different universities? Do you go, you know, do you put all the reports side by side? Um, or if you, um, for example, want to know what data they have published about, you can simply take this kind of visualizations and see that, well, actually, if we want to compare the universities, there are some issues. For example, here we can see that uh, they have been uh, three different universities. They have been using different kind of keywords for publications, like uh, be it a report, article, book, document, right? 
so as you can see, for example, here only two universities have used this keyword or tag document, right? So that means that you only can compare those, those two universities on documents. But I mean document, come on, it's, it's kind of generic. So perhaps report in another place means actually document in another place. So, but this, this kind of issues about the data quality come only visible when you actually have opened the data. So this is the, this is the argument. And of course, you can uh, learn many other things. For example, uh, we can learn how to make data visualizations. I mean, I mean, if we have all the open data available, we can uh, we can create uh, videos like we have done. Like, okay, well, if you take this vid visualization, and then uh, let's look how we actually do this kind of visualization. This is me <laughs> uh, showing the uh, the same visualization actually. What else? So then we can also see. Um, how people have accessed all these visualizations. So um, we can check, um, I mean, we can use learning analytics. We can look at online and see that, well, in a certain period of time, like 9,000 people from US have been accessing all these videos, all these tutorials to understand how to make these kind of visualizations. So if you think about it, it's like, Openness brings in so many ways new possibilities. Of course, if you get a lot of uh, users and a lot of visibility, I mean, Mikko was telling about Linux. I mean, perhaps some people find you and perhaps they invite you to give a nice, you know, conference talk or, you know, tutorial in, let's say, USA or Amsterdam or whatever. I'm going to California in a few weeks. So, I mean, this is, this is really uh, bringing a lot of um, possibilities. Um, in this kind of examples, the, the crucial thing is to use, um, use um, uh, links, of course, between different kinds of things. So, um, I mean, open data, that is, that is of course, very good. But, but one of the problems is that uh, if, even if you have a lot of different kinds of open data, it's not very easy to make analysis, I mean, to make new science or faster science, if you don't have links between different kinds of things. So, uh, for example, if you remember the uh, first visualization where we're looking at the uh, publications per buildings, there we need uh, links between, of course, publications with buildings, but sometimes with the data set, you have to follow like publication to person, person to department, department to building. You have to find a way to link different kinds of things together in order to make such a visual analysis. And of course, some links are better than others, some links are you know, for example, department is not always in the same building. It might be that there are departments that are in several buildings. So you have to really find how to actually make use of all these links, how to create new links, and uh, sometimes also be careful because otherwise your uh, analysis might um, go wrong. So um, also, if you think about open data, uh, open science, I mean, who would uh, start publishing open data just, just alone, right? I mean, or repositories of, of online learning tutorials showing how to use open data. So I think it's, it's really crucial to create communities um, uh, around open science and online learning. So uh, linkedscience.org, this is one community I established, uh, I think, five years ago. So it's actually, we called it Linked Open Science at the start, but then, you know, for the, for the sake of, uh, of simplicity, we called it linkedscience.org. So it's all about uh, publishing uh, data, methods, tutorials, of course, so online learning, but then also to run workshops on, on related things. Uh, for example, um, last year we had a workshop on like, uh, if you have um, a lot of online materials, like repository even, um, on how to, um, how to analyze data, how to visualize data, especially in the, in the spatial domain, um, then how do, we, um, how do we actually make um, a community around it? So this was a workshop to start um, creating this kind of community and then of course to start creating different kinds of repositories uh, where people can actually put the education materials that access online data and create a faster cycle for, uh, for learning. Um, another thing is that I wanted to mention, this is, uh, this is a project uh, we are running in Germany. So I'm an external collaborator of this, um, this project. So this is um, like taking research settings 
and making them truly reproducible. So not just data, but also methods. I mean, previous talks were also talking about this. So really thinking about the whole science cycle or science uh, scientific uh, process. Um, supporting um, also to analyze, to understand, I mean, what happens in different phases of the process and making everything openly available for others to, to make use of. Um, this is a DFG-funded uh, project uh, with, with the library also very actively um, uh, involved in this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, activity. Um, so library, actually this is good to mention, how many of you are from libraries? So like uh, almost, yeah, <laughs> wow, 90-80 percent, something like that. So um, I know that at least in other universities there is a there is a big task now to find a new role for the library. So we call even the new, I mean, new. It's not new library, but it's it's the new learning center, but it's old library kind of. Did you see <laughs> the point? And this is um, it's all about naming, like finding a new role for something that used to be library. I mean, with less books, with more online things but for more like um, need for uh, meeting different people, we need to find a new uh, role for the library. So perhaps uh, hosting uh, really this open science efforts, reproducible uh, research settings, and then um, teaching, you know, via online means or, or on-site uh, workshops, others to, to make use of, uh, of the resources. This could also be the really the um, big, big uh, role for the library in the, in the future really supporting the faster uh, scientific uh, cycles. Exactly like, uh, like um, books were um, serving the, um, the same role uh, before. Uh, let me show you also one example. So this is um, this like where, if you think about space and time, I mean, we are now in, uh, in one place in a, in a certain uh, time. So, um, and if you think, if you take about um, this kind of really big questions like how do we study, study the complex world, which is also related to what Tuli was uh, telling earlier. Um, the uh, big task here is to try to find what open data and open science methods they are already available. So um, for example, if we, um, if we take uh, this kind of really big questions like environmental, economical and social observations, I mean, traditionally, I think uh, Mikko can perhaps agree that like environmental observations, they have been like producing, produced by, by kind of single group of, of institutes, like meteorological institutes. Um, we were collaborating with the Brazilian Space Research Institute. They had a lot of, lot of environmental uh, observations, but they didn't have economical or social observations. Economical, for example, the market prices or social observations where people actually live and, and do they work or not, and this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, questions. Um, we took all of these data together and, and uh, made a uh, setting where you can actually visualize um, um, data about the deforestation. So this is the Hague, this is the deforestation. And then um, in, a, in a certain area in, in Brazilian Amazon rainforest. And then at the same time show how much uh, meat they export to different countries. Uh, and of course you cannot do this kind of things. I mean, if you only take one like data set, you have to take different kinds of data together in order to start understanding like the bigger picture, what is really happening. So with the point is that uh, you are not perhaps doing the actual science with this kind of, uh, this kind of um, visualizations, but what is crucial that you can perhaps find out nice hypotheses. I mean, what if actually they are not cutting the trees for the trees themselves, but for putting cattle there in order to export meat? Of course, this is, I mean, <laughs> I mean this is not a new scientific finding, so this is already found out a few years ago. But this is an example of like really putting all data together and creating faster uh, science uh, cycles. So this, by the way, the uh, visualization um, is now in the Brazilian Space Research Institute's uh, scientific exhibition. So it's, it's, it's uh, something where you can, um, with your um, um, hands actually interactively explore all the data 
and uh, we use Kinect system. I don't want to go to details <laughs> with the lack of time, but, uh, but I can show you later on how it actually works. Um, you, can, um, you can explore um, the science efforts. I mean, if you think about Brazilian Space Research Institute, they have a lot of data. They, have, they are actually really serious about getting data. They, they build satellites, then they rotate them, test them, and then they uh, contact Chinese rocket <laughs> business uh, companies, and then they send them to space. So they're really serious about it. But now, so it's a really a lot of science uh, in there. But, but now the big question or big, um, I think, uh, task for us is to, to somehow enable to do um, interactive browsing of all these science efforts uh, via time, space and theme. So this is one, one big theme um, or a big task. Um, and then also, um, also if you think about um, now science, I mean, Mikko was telling about fast science. I really like it because I've been also using it. We need to um, ensure that, uh, that we do uh, relevant science and also faster science and not do science that has been done already before, right? Uh, unless we want to reproduce it. I mean, unless we want to check if, if it really uh, works like that. So I would say these are the two, um, two um, key tasks there. And I will, I will show you uh, one example of um, um, how we have, for example, uh, done. As the, um, as the final step. So we took uh, 23,000 uh, articles from a journal called uh, Journal on uh, Tropical Diseases. And then we checked uh, like how people have been um, making research over time. And we can clearly find that uh, some countries, I mean, are less researched about in certain years. So for example, you can easily spot wars I mean, nobody wanted to go there because, I mean, there was war in Darfur, for example, in Sudan. Um, so we can understand how science actually works. Perhaps not all of these are surprising, but perhaps there are some things that, okay, well, you know, um, okay, there must have been something why people didn't do uh, research about, uh, about certain years. Um, then another one, uh, we took the same, um, oh wow, same uh, data set um, and uh, we plotted on maps. So what can you see here? This is the 23,000 um, articles about tropical diseases. Tropical diseases, can you see something interesting here? Huh? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. What else? Can you see Africa? Some exactly, 23,000 articles and not a single one is, uh, is looking at certain countries in, the, in the Africa. So um, um, this is my point, like, uh, and we actually, we were really interested in why this happens. We used, um, we used NLP techniques to, in order to find out the place names. We didn't use affiliations at all, so that would have been first guess, of course, that okay, perhaps most researchers are affiliated with the uh, Northern Europe or, uh, or European or Northern yeah. American uh, universities. So we took out all of the affiliations and we took only the place names, like what are these scientific efforts really about? And, um, and it turned out that um, when we look at the examples that many, in many cases the research setting has been starting from the tourists that actually come from the tropical countries back to like USA, back to Alaska for example, back to uh, Northern Europe and then of course they create uh, incentives for actually uh, making um, uh, research about uh, tropical diseases. So these are like uh, the, exactly in time, <laughs> by, by noon, uh, like I think the, the key tasks that we want to, want to support. Um, hey, one last thing, one last thing, this one. So um, this, is, um, this is something um, where we took um, participation seriously. So this is two examples, like Jim and Tim. Jim participated in a conference two times and then didn't participate. Then participated third time but never came back. Tim, on the other hand, participated five times, then came, uh, didn't come once, 
but then ever since came uh, back. So uh, we took 100,000 participations in conferences, in different kinds of conferences, and then examined them. And this visualizes um, the, the results. The idea is that, um, I mean, it's kind of intuitively clear. I mean, more you participate in a certain community, more likely it is that you participate in the future as well. So the red color is like more likely to participate in the future. But what is really interesting here is that this is independent about the size, location, diversity, topic, and so on about the conference, at least those six conference series that we were looking at. So the point is that if you have, just imagine, if you have a lot of open data about how science actually works, I mean, kind of hidden stories about how science works, perhaps we can, you know, start really understanding, uh, you know, like, <laughs> Well, I don't know how funding also works, how anything works uh, in, this, in this world. Good, so, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Time for one quick comment or question. I know I promised you throughout the morning session that we'd have more time to talk, but so let's take a couple of minutes for that, and I can assure you that you will still have time for lunch. We'll have the whole 60 minutes for lunch, even though we stay here for a couple of more minutes and let, example, for example, Tuli to, Tuli to comment or ask a question. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation and also for, for other presenters. I, I really enjoyed them. Uh, one thing that I was wondering, as you started with the measurements of, of the universities and so on, like yeah. providing numbers, and of course that is something that, that like uh, open data allows us to do to be calculating new measures. Yeah. Yeah. But but then there's again the wag the dog kind of situation that, that I'd like us to see somehow to move from the continuous development of measures to be really thinking that are we answering the big questions and, and somehow if we calculate publications, if we calculate people, if we calculate tweets, if we calculate tweets like yeah. old metrics kind of thing, so then sexual behavior of, of uh, gorillas is the most important thing in the world, isn't it? Because everyone is tweeting about them or whatever this kind of topic that, that makes people laugh a bit and, and it's funny. So so we, we sort of really carefully, and, and that's some, something that I, I'd really like to emphasize, that us researchers would be active in thinking that how openness of science would be valued. So what would be the ways of valuing yeah. it? What would be the ways how we would like it to be valued? And what would be the measures that could be used? There's a sort of huge sort of group of people in, in the European Union level, of course, in Finland as well, thinking the different metrics, but that we wouldn't sort of fool ourselves of, of falling into simple metrics that don't yeah. really show the, the real societal impo importance of, of our work. Uh, and maybe related to the FMI example as well, I was thinking that if we think about, we would be really pleased on seeing that how our data is being used and you were sort of suggesting that we would be tracking that down and that's what we would like to do. But if we want to be really sharing things openly, so then at least we can't be uh, sort of requiring registration from anyone. And, and then we've sort of suggested that those who use the data would be informing us. Uh, but that's of course only a suggestion and it doesn't really yet yield the result that, that we could be a like counting. But you presented already clever ways of doing it, like seeing how many hits you get and, and so on. But again, so is it so that we calculate numbers if there's three research groups who load, download our data and then they do some sort of super magnificent work on it? So if it's only three, but it, it matters, so then the number maybe doesn't tell it. And, and like changing this thing would be so important. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. So, um, so I think it's really important to uh, gather all these different kinds of uh, evidences about how, how science works and then really think heavily like what actually 
is important. Uh, and I think uh, visual exploration might help in that. So, I mean, cutting the different, the data different ways and then seeing like, well, are we really interested in this kind of, um, this kind of evidences or some other ways of, of, uh, of, uh, of about the uh, efforts, uh, scientific efforts, yeah. If I comment back to Thule, uh, I think that uh, registration for getting the data, when it's really just give you your email address, which is pretty much the only thing which is necessary, and then you get the access, that becomes more and more common in many places. So I would say that research will get used to that, and it's not really anymore so like no barriers at all. But this one small barrier, I think most of most of uh, researchers will accept and, and also just the public who wants to get in access. But it makes us, for example, we do all kinds of surveys targeted to the ones who have used the data. So from time to time we ask, are you happy about that data set? We haven't seen anyone using it and we get very well answers back. So I think that's just how it improves the kind of uh, science in the sense that even the attraction of where is it in the data that someone wants to do something will guide the producer of the data to pay more attention to that. And I think uh, it is very crucial that we get, uh, and it's not about the big numbers of something, we have exactly the same, like point observations or point forecasts for some points in the world is the biggest, like most asked things, and the weather forecast model data set as a whole is really just a few. But let's face it, that's Ule, that's like, come on, these are the ones who then make a lot of visualization and then have their own showing it to the world process after that. So they, there I think it's just linking again those things to how much attraction they get. So the w internet technology is I think very, very much in the, in, in the kind of main spot to understand that when you do it through this, then you get all that capability of doing what he is doing uh, because I think without many of those yeah. let's say where it gets registered that something happened if that doesn't happen we can lose a lot of very interesting let's say results which are interesting also to help that research to be motivated because I think that's where research funding should more and more go into and it will I, I assure you <laughs> Thank you. And the last comment or question goes to Tina Wright. Yes. Uh, thanks. And thanks for the very good presentations, all of you. And just a little comment about this visualization, because I think it's very important for the decision makers. For, for example, if you show this uh, Brazilian forests, this, uh, cutting them and bringing the meat mm -hmm. here to Europe or US and it's cheap and then uh, you make the citizens aware once you have seen yeah. this and you know that it's not cheap meat at all. I think it's very important kind of things and then it also comes back to the research and it makes visual that it's important to make the research. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the comment. This was actually the main motivation for us uh, back then when we were doing it. Mm -hmm like the raise the public awareness. It was um, made within a GI at school uh, project. So where, you know, if you start educating high school uh, kids or even, even younger kids like about the importance of, of uh, dealing with spatial information uh, using geoinformatics to under actually understand how, how the world works. And yeah, thanks for the 